Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Myth Salon. My name is Dana White, and we have an exciting panel with us today. I'm going to start with Dr. Elizabeth Nelson, who is a longtime friend who went through the depth program at Pacifica and did her dissertation called Psyche's Knife, which is now a book. I would like to do a short poem, and then I want to do the singing bowl. This is by Rumi, and it's out of one of his collections called Hush. You think of yourself as a citizen of the universe. You think you belong to this world of dust and matter. Out of this dust, you have created a personal image, and you have forgotten about the essence of your true origin. Do you know what you are? You are a manuscript of a divine letter. You are a mirror reflecting a noble face. The universe is not outside of you. Look inside yourself. Everything that you want, you are already that. So, as the country screams past 3 million coronavirus cases today, I'd like us just to have a little moment of silence. A beautiful welcome to everyone today. Thank you very much for all being here. So, Dr. Lin, would you like to unmute, do a few introductions? Um, I don't know if I did a sufficient introduction for Elizabeth, but I just would like to say she's a very dear friend, part of the Pacifica faculty, part of the Pacifica administration, and ha I was one of the first people that I hired when I started becoming a department chair at an art college. And uh, Taria as well, who we had, was it last time? Yes, Taria was last time. And she's on the panel today as well because she and Elizabeth have developed a long-term friendship as well. So, Will? Uh, Dana, thank you everybody, obviously, uh, for, for being here, uh, panelists and audience. Uh, great to be with everybody. What a day. Um, and just to ground us in the day that it is, I, I thought I'd share that, uh, and just a recommendation, if you're a mythologist, it's pretty easy to sign up for uh, the world's holidays to show up on your calendar and then look them up every time. So uh, today is, the, is a Jewish day, a Jewish holiday. It's the day that the temple walls were breached, uh, sorry, the walls of Jerusalem were breached uh, before the fall of the second temple, three weeks later by the Romans. It's also the day that Moses brought down the uh, tablets from the mountain and broke them when he saw the idols. And by the way, the first July 4th, the original signing of the De Declaration of Independence was on, on this holiday. Uh, so it's an interesting day, a day of change. Uh, and so I hope we'll all keep that in mind. And I know we're, we're seeing as enough change as we can about stomach. Um, wonderful to continue our conversations around media and culture and what's going on in our world. Uh, many people are trying to make sense of these things and it's a real privilege to get to work with uh, incredible scholars, thinkers, psychologists to help really dive in and make sense of how our media is informing our relationship with what's going on right now. Tonight, of course, we'll be talking about the Hunger Games, uh, which Elizabeth will, will introduce and move into. Uh, I'm personally uh, moved significantly by Katniss as a character. She, uh, to me, I'm a Prometheus is my number one mythic figure. And so to me, she is uh, Prometheus and Artemis, you know, got together and, and, and brought the best that they both had to offer. Uh, so I love the character. I'm excited to dig into, uh, into that character some more. Uh, to introduce the panel really quickly, and then we'll get started. Um, 
uh, is we had Taria last week. I'll mention that she's a Pacifica Depth uh, psychologist, PhD, who moved to North Carolina uh, to start a retreat center, and she did the last Miss Salon with us on indigenous ways of knowing. Uh, Selena Matthews is a practicing psychologist and Pacifica graduate. Uh, Voris is a philosophy professor. Uh, Corinne Bordeaux is with us tonight, which is an exciting uh, guest panel, who is an exciting guest panelist. Uh, Corinne puts on the um, uh, Esalen Film Festivals and also promotes uh, major films every year, uh, Academy Award winning or nominated film. Uh, and she's also a Pacifica graduate. Uh, and another one of the tribe that's really uh, supportive of the relationship between myth and film and our community and the Hollywood community. Thanks for being here tonight with us, Corinne. Um, and also John, a special guest with us tonight. Uh, John, uh, who presented previously with us, is a graduate of Pacifica's Myth program, finished his PhD within the last uh, 12 months. Uh, on Joseph Campbell, by the way, Joseph Campbell's work, uh, and is a, really a leading voice in popular culture and mythology. Uh, so really a privilege to have you here with us, John. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have uh, Zaman Stanizai uh, as well, who is a poet and a, uh, a teacher at Pacifica Graduate Institute and philosopher and mythologist. Um, and looking around our table, I've, we did it. We're around the table. Uh, and Dana, of course, you know, who is a uh, um, founder of this Myth Salon, uh, professor at Pacifica and works on dissertations as well. And, you know, the one other thing I, I'd mention about, uh, to add to your bio on Elizabeth, I just want to say that when I was going through my dissertation formulation, hers was one of the dissertations that was held up as an example. And that means a lot when the insiders value you enough to share you with more insiders like that as an example. So uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for being part of this group and for uh, taking us into uh, District, District uh, 12 tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will and Dana, for such a fine introduction. And um, welcome to all the panelists and everybody who's attending. Um, I'm excited about tonight's presentation. So I'm sure I'm not the only one to say that health metaphors have been on my mind lately. Um, and so it isn't surprising that a few weeks ago I began thinking about stories as a, as a vital third circulatory system of human life. They are as important to communal health as are the flow of blood and lymph in the individual body. Stories connect us economically, politically, culturally, and spiritually. So we are not only what we believe, say, and do, we also are the stories we tell. And that's a theme that's come through in many of these Myth Salon presentations. Literature, which includes millennia of oral and written stories, myths, legends, and fairy tales, as well as contemporary novels and cinema, shares with psychology a focus on human experience and beyond our place in the more than human world. Literature, though, has one critical advantage over psychology. Literature is not a science and is not caught in its own evolutionary legend. Psychology, on the other hand, assumes that today's theories are better than those of yesteryear through some ill-defined process of natural selection that denigrates older concepts from deep-rooted non-Western cultures. As Sonu Shandasani asserts, this is a highly questionable assumption. It's an assumption that aligns psychology and its evolutionary legend with other equally bankrupt legends, such as endless growth, manifest destiny, and human progress. I recommend Shandasani's book on the history of Jungian psychology. So literature, including tonight's films, are full of ideas and imagination. They take us beyond the present moment, beyond our personal joys and sorrows, because imagination is the stepping stone into what I call eco-intelligence. Eco-intelligence is a way of being and seeing that is relational, broad, and deep. It regards time on a cosmic scale. It regards humanity as participants in the cosmos, tiny, fragile, and necessary. 
Eco-intelligence also reveals four sweeping meta-narratives that condition human thought and behavior right now and have been doing so for millennia. And these meta-narratives, which I've talked about at length with Laura Lee Scott, who presented a few weeks ago, and with Boris Nunley over the last several weeks, these meta-narratives include systemic misogyny, systemic racism, systemic homophobia, which includes transphobia, and the systemic commodification of all life. The idea that everything is for sale and everyone is a customer. So I mentioned eco-intelligence right at the beginning because it contributes to an idea that's on stage today in political life and it's woven closely into the fictional fabric of the Hunger Games. One of these ideas is that we will never know the full impact of our words and actions. All we know is that they will have an impact. As Katniss Everdeen, the protagonist of Hunger Games, discovers, one swift, sharp arrow can bring down the entire game. But as Katniss realizes, the first shot is just the beginning. Because in this story, and I'm going to begin sharing screen now, there are games within games. My, so my theme for tonight's webinar arises from the deadly serious game that plays out on multiple levels within the narrative. And that deadly serious game is called real or not real. So as I begin, I wanna mention something that James Hillman tells us, which is that it's very important to pay attention to all culture all forms of human activity. And that, in fact, that's at the heart of archetypal psychology's move beyond the four walls of the therapy room. Psychology just doesn't belong to therapists, although wonderful work is done there. Psychology belongs in culture as we look at what is happening in our world today. The second point I want to make as I begin is something that Angela McRobbie tells us where she says that contemporary media, including novels, film, television, and music are enormously influential, not just among the young. They define emergent sexual codes of conduct, they pass judgment, and they establish the rules of play. Now, any of us here who is an archetypal psychologist or a Jungian by training a, a mythologist understands the important impact of images. And that's something we see in cinema. I think that's why there's such a rich literature on cinem cinematic arts and Jungian psychology. It's a kind of a natural pairing. So it's important to play, pay attention to popular culture. It's not frivolous. And that's the underlying assertion that I wanna make for tonight's lecture. So let's talk a little bit about this, this franchise, The Hunger Games. Like millions of readers around the world, the novels enchanted me. Like other devoted fans, I want, went to each of the movies during opening weekend. Here's a few statistics. In August 2014, Amazon announced that the Hunger Games trilogy had officially surpassed J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter as the best-selling book series of all time. At the same time uh, in that uh, in that year, in 2014, the, the uh, Guinness Book of World Records announced that Katniss Everdeen was the world's most popular female protagonist. As of 2019, The Hunger Games has been translated into 53 languages with more than 100 million copies in print. The other thing that's important to mention about this is it has spawned, it it's really has changed the landscape of young adult fiction and it has spawned a number of other popular series, some of which are very, very good, like uh, Veronica Roth's Divergent series, Marie Lu's Legend series. And this is a point I'm gonna come back to later, but um, it's important to remember that these are not books that are just being purchased and read by teenagers. There are a lot of people, including women my age, <laughs> that are reading them avidly. They're, the, the fan base extends beyond the young adults audience that this is these are supposedly pitched towards. So now I want to turn my attention to a troubling theme, but one that's important in 
the Hunger Games and its important in reality. Dystopia, real or not real? Some of you may recognize that this is a photograph of District 12 from the Hunger Games after the Capitol has bombed it basically into non-existence. Um, a very few hundred survivors remain. But let's talk a little bit about dystopian fiction, what it is and where, it's, where it comes from, and a little bit about it in history too. So dystopian fiction is the opposite of and complement to utopian fiction. That's a word that was first used by Sir Thomas More in his 1516 book, Utopia. The word utopia resembles two Greek words, otopos, which translates to no place, and utopos, which translates to good place. More's book portrays an ideal society, but it's written in an ambiguous style with ironic overtones. So a little bit about what qualifies as dystopian fiction, what, what makes it dystopian. So dystopian fiction depicts a society that's characterized by mass poverty, squalor, suffering, or oppression that originates in social, economic, and political factors. In other words, the, the dystopia, the suffering, is avoidable. There's a complementary relationship between dystopia and utopia. Many purported utopias suppress justice, freedom, and happiness for anyone that they define as other. Dystopian fiction is powerful because it presents an imaginable future, one that is like a likely consequence of our current behavior, beliefs, thinking, and public policy. And finally, the most powerful dystopian or utopian fiction predicts the future with uncanny accuracy. So um, it may not come as a surprise to anybody in this audience, I doubt it will, but since the election of Donald Trump in 2016, there has been a surge of interest in dystopian classics. Uh, frightened readers began turning to classic dystopian fiction, uh, such as The Handmaid's Tale, published 35 years ago, uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm, and George Orwell's 1984 sales rose drastically. And in fact, Atwood, Margaret Atwood, um, began hearing from anxious readers almost immediately after Trump's election, who began to see eerie parallels between the novel's oppressive society and the administration's policy goals of curtailing reproductive rights. One of the signs that uh, was carried in a protest was make Margaret Atwood fiction again. Another sign read, The Handmaid's Tale is not an instruction manual. Atwood's publisher, noticing this rise in interest, immediately printed an additional 100,000 copies to meet the demand. And the demand has not gone away. So dystopian fiction is, uh, is popular. It's more popular now than it ever was. Uh, and there are reasons. It's because there's an echo between what we read in these powerful works of fiction and what we are seeing playing out on the world stage. So another way that we can understand the impact of the Hunger Games is considering it as a threat. So threat, in other words, is a measure of influence. And this is an ironic testimony, if you will, to the impact of the Hunger Games because there's been a concerted effort to ban the books in many areas of the US. Some of the reasons that were given for banning these books is that they are anti-ethnic, anti-family, too violent, too sexual. There are occult and satanic elements and they are irreligious. I wanna say a couple things about a few of these points. I think the only valid one is that the books are anti-ethnic and they're anti-ethnic in the sense that the major characters, uh, which is uh, Katniss, Peeta Malark, and Gale are all white, as well as are all of the members of District 12. So I think you, I think you could make a, make a claim that the, that the series is anti-ethnic, but there are also very important characters who are African-American. 
um, including the, the actual future president of the, the of Pan Am uh, when the series is over. And I will, I will return to her and, and talk about her a little bit. The, the piece about there being occult or satanic elements, apparently the Hunger Games salute, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more, um, is satanic. Um, and it's also satanic because the books teach children how to create a new world order. The religious viewpoint, the fact that the books are considered irreligious, more has to do with the fact that um, an ex it's an example of what's called Deus Absconditus, the absent God, the, the God that has, has left the world, if you will. Um, and in fact, that is also true. There aren't any religious traditions or practices that are represented apart from the annual reaping of children, 24 children from each district who are um, uh, put into an arena and battled to the death. Um, however, there is a religious element in the Hunger Games. What's worshipped is money and power. In 2010 alone, there were 348 cases involving the banning of the trilogy, making it among the top 10 banned books of all time. So another way to measure the influence of something like the Hunger Games is to look at the way it crosses over into real life. Um, so in 2014, rebels protesting Thailand's military junta adopted the Hunger Games salute, which you see depicted here. A Time Magazine article about the junta and about the Hunger Games salute says, if life does imitate art, ties may have reason to worry. The three-fingered salute has become an emotionally charged symbol of rebellion. And the same article reported that already scores of those proffering the salute during the weekend protests were dragged off by troops in scenes eerily reminiscent of, of the Suzanne Collins novels and movie franchise which depict a, a dystopian future society ruled by the totalitarian Pan Am regime. Brad Adams, who was the director of the Humans right, Human Rights Watch Asia, Asia Division, calls the Hunger Games salute a symbolic act of peaceful defiance amid a situation that is spiraling downward in terms of rights abuses. The fact that the junta is closing down sections of the city to chase a handful of protesters reveals a totalitarian mindset that discounts respect for human rights as a hindrance and sees youthful defiance as the enemy. He said this in, a, in an email and then repeated a tweet from the, uh, the Thai protesters. Dear Hunger Gamers, the tweet said, we've taken your sign as our own. Our struggle is nonfiction. Thanks. So what about the fresh relevance of Hunger Games? I think you're probably already hearing some echoes in just what I've said so far, but it didn't occur to me that this series, this franchise was so powerful and so spookily uh, on, on the nose, if you will, um, until about a month or so ago. Okay, like all of us, I'm sheltering in place from the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I sat down to watch the films again, thinking that I would just sort of escape from our present painful social, cultural, and political reality. I would binge watch and I would sort of check out, but the result was very different. I realized that the themes of the Hunger Games are more prophetic now than when the story was published a decade ago. I was surprised at how freshly relevant it is. Considering the long history of racism and tyranny that have been characteristic of human history for at least 5,000 years, the relevance of the Hunger Games will not fade. In fact, the game within the games, as I mentioned earlier, the final game at the end of the story is entirely appropriate to an age characterized by the manipulation of power by social media the tax on the fourth estate, and the prevalence of infotainment. How does the average citizen, even the informed citizen, distinguish between real and not real? 
Real or not real is the game at the heart of the Hunger Games. It is one of the games at the heart of American politics and culture too, and has been for at least three years. So let me turn now to a little bit more about the game as it's played by Katniss and Peeta Malark in the franchise, in the series of, of films. So Peeta, who you see here, has been tortured by Cornelius Snow and he's been weaponized by the Capitol. He can't sort out his own story, which includes his longstanding love for Katniss. When the Rebel Alliance liberates the Capitol prisoners, their first task is to attempt to restore their original stories by helping them recall their pre-captivity identity. The Rebels help them, in essence, to distinguish between false beliefs planted in them during the torture sessions and their genuine beliefs and experiencing experiences arising from their life before they were imprisoned and tortured. So Peta, Peta and Katniss play this very serious game that has profound consequences. Whenever something happens or uh, Peta will make a statement about a memory, he will turn to Katniss and say, real or not real? And because Peta is the nice one and Katniss is tough, honest and clear-eyed, she tells the truth. Peta's challenge is to trust her and to trust the truth she tells. So at one point he asks why he should believe her. And another key member of their circle, Finnick O'Dare says, because we are your allies. In the end, however, this proves to be an inadequate answer, which shows the genius and relevance of Suzanne Collins' fictional world the Hunger Games of the franchise title ostensibly the annual festival designed to keep the peace among 12 remaining districts is not the only game being played. There are games within games. Several key figures are game makers in this fantasy world, not just the appointed director of the annual event that pits 24 children against one another in a battle to the death. Many game makers. Katniss's task is to figure out who they are. So let me say a little bit more about I love, why I love this series and tell you that it's part of a long-standing interest of mine in the topic of women in power, which I've spoken about and written about. And uh, so I, I could go on and on about this topic. I'm not going to. I promise to restrain myself. But what I love about this particular series is that it dramatizes how a private, desperate, and resilient young woman grows into her own power, which means that we need to look at power a little bit, not just women in power. So speaking psychologically, viewing power as masculine, something that it, you know, is the preserve of males, is antithetical to Carl Jung's theory of individuation. It denies a woman's wholeness, which would allow all possibilities in the optimum development of our character. Speaking sociologically, adopting a limited view of woman's aptitude for power, including her actual capacity for aggression is naive. It's a remnant of the 19th century image of woman as the angel in the house, morally superior to men, and entrusted with upholding the purity of society and culture. This naive idea is unfair to women and it's unfair to men. Speaking cognitively, thinking of power as masculine also reflects one idea of power, power as domination, as opposed to a finely differentiated understanding of the many kinds of power indigenous to humanity. The idea of domination dominates our idea of power, as James Hillman asserted. So long as it does, we will remain dangerously ignorant. So one of the fine things that Hillman does is he applies his keen mind in, in his book, Kinds of Power, to different archetypal patterns of power. So it's not just power over or domination, but influence, charisma, the power of the office, I have added things like the power of persistence. These are all kinds of power. All right, and we're gonna see more of that with Katniss. 
But Katniss, I want to mention, is again one of many fierce young women who have become uh, quite prominent in uh, fiction, which includes both novels as well as cinema, in the last 20, 25 years. So what are the qualities of these fierce young women? They are vital, passionate, and intensely committed to a cause. They discover and develop a distinctive form of power. They use their power on behalf of those they love. They develop a strong affiliation with their pack. Their prowess includes clear strategic thinking, physical strength, toughness, and skill. It also includes psychological strength. So I'm sure that some of you can already begin to imagine the other fierce young women that I'm thinking of. Um, certainly Daenerys Targaryen from HBO's Game of Thrones series, uh, certainly Triss Pryor from the Divergent series, uh, certainly Rey from Star Wars. Um, so there are many, many others that, that you, can, you can name. And um, I, I think it's fascinating to look at them as a group and, and try to understand who they are and how they are with their power. So a little bit more about this, these young women. Some common elements among these contemporary female protagonists, like Katniss, they form a pack out of disparate subgroups. In other words, their pack is not a homogenous uh, culture, but in fact, they, they intentionally gather together um, and refuse to split um, uh, these uh, people or, or groups into uh, uh, competing factions. They overcome the kind of factionalism and othering that we see in other forms of leadership. Gee, I'm wondering who I'm talking about. All right, their power is not self-serving or egotistical. It serves a communal goal. And again, they, they're creating community as they go. They're, they're banding people together very important idea. Um, they are frequently underestimated by friend and foe alike because they are female. In some cases, these young women are um, diminutive, physically diminutive. A classic example of that is Elizabeth Salander, um, who is described as barely five feet tall and weighing about 90 pounds, um, but she's absolutely deadly. Um, so being underestimated is actually one of their strengths. It's a strategic advantage, let me, let me put it that way. So let's talk about um, the fact that the contemporary fierce young woman is not a new phenomenon. The historian, Antonia Fraser, says, there is something deep in the human spirit which binds in the image of the strong and armed woman a figure of awe. Such images are an inspiration to women as well as a source of threat and excitement to men. Fierce young women in the news very recently, June 27th, uh, there was a New York Times column called In Her Words, which I highly recommend, and it profiled the young women who were um, starting protest marches and notice these three young women, Brianna Chandler, 19, Tiana Day, 17, Z. Thomas, 15. Chandler says, what's something about my generation that people get wrong? That our anger is not valid, that we don't have a reason to riot. None of these women was a, a, a leader or imagined themselves a, as a leader, but within a week or so of the murder of George Floyd, they began activities, actions, protest marches, where they thought that they were gonna maybe gather, oh, I don't know, 50 friends, and thousands of people showed up. So these are fierce young women today. This is a clear crossover, I think, to what we're seeing in The Hunger Games and other female protagonist-led fiction. So, let me say a little bit more about the adolescent imagination. Richard Frankel, in his wonderful book on the adolescent psyche, says we must attend to how the adolescent's imagination is fed through the music, movies, television, literature, and poetry that they're attracted to and actively seek out. From an archetypal perspective, 
we might ask, how do the songs, poems, dances, and stories resonate with pre-existing patterns in the adolescent psyche that actively demand attention? Now, it's not just the adolescent imagination that needs to be fed and must be fed. And in fact, I wanna turn our attention to the film, the 28th film that honestly should have won the Academy Award for Best Picture. And I wanna turn our attention to the importance of representation and imagination. Some of you may recognize this image as General Okoye, part of the Dora Milaje, part of the Honor Guard, um, very skilled women who protect the king of Wakanda. But I wanna go beyond this and say, not only do I love this image, but, but here are the words of Jamie Broadnax, who describes herself as a black female comic book geek. She says, seeing big screen versions of Nakia, Okoye, Shuri, Queen Ramonda, and all the women of the Dora Milaje was something I never expected in my lifetime. Any given white man can easily walk into a comic book store and see an abundance of superheroes that look just like him. He's surrounded by an industry that empowers him to believe he can be anything he wants to be, at least metaphorically. But Black Panther takes that supernatural, extraordinary stuff of modern myth and gives it to a bunch of characters who aren't white men and include black women. It bolsters our confidence and gives us the courage to believe in how we see ourselves. So representation in fiction and in real life has a great deal of power. I also wanna to return to a point that I was mentioning earlier, which is that Katniss Everdeen, General Okoye, um, all of these uh, figures in the fantasy fiction um, have cross-generational appeal. So I believe uh, that an archetypal approach is more appropriate. Rather than treating girlhood as, as a stage of life that one enters and exits, archetypal psychology views it as a pattern of experience that occurs biologically during youth, but also re-arises in response to various stimuli over the course of a woman's life. Within a mature woman, the pattern of experience can be, can be reactivated and remembered. So that's why you see at opening weekend for things like the Hunger Games and Star Wars, you see young, young women and men, and you also see a lot of people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s equally excited about these fierce young women. So let's go on to Katniss Everdeen and say just a little bit more about her. Um, she grows up in a bleak dystopian world that reflects the actual fears of our political, economic, and environmental collapse among young people today. One critic ominously described the Hunger Games as the novel of their generation because it depicts adolescents rigor rigorously trained by adults for desperate but meaningless life or death competitions. Its dark emptiness resonates with students' latent unease and dissatisfaction. They're driven by fear. Katniss, the protagonist of the Hunger Games, is forced to become the family's provider at a young age. She has no illusions about the political, economic, and spiritual oppression the inhabitants of District 12 face every day. To keep her family fed, she travels beyond the electrified fence that no longer has any current a sign of the community's endemic disrepair. There she hunts game with her ally, Gail, who also supports his impoverished family that way. Thus, Katniss is portrayed as a natural predator, agile, strong, and highly skilled with a bow and arrow for the purpose of survival, not sport. Her pack is clearly her family, her friends, and the wider community of District 12, which is all the world that she knows as the trilogy begins. Katniss's knowledge of the oppression deepens when, volunteers, when she volunteers in place of her 12-year-old sister for the annual Hunger Games. She is literally groomed for success, which has less to do with physical survival in the arena and more to do with her entertainment value. The wealth of the capital is a grotesque contrast 
to the widespread squalor of the home district. The Hunger Games trilogy holds up a mirror to the growing economic divide in contemporary America. But more importantly, Katniss is allowed what we so seldom see in books or movies, the freedom to be a person first and anything else, which may include her gender second. Although Katniss may be focused, tough-minded, and driven, she is neither unfeeling nor indifferent. As the girl on fire and ultimately the Mockingjay, she becomes the symbol of the rebellion, succeeds in uniting populations that the capital was eager to keep divided. The overarching imperative to survive the bleak dystopia endows Katniss with a realistic, pitiless cast of mind, intense focus, and disciplined willpower. She can think strategically and when impassioned by a cause is a relentless fighter. Katniss occasionally is allied to the males in the stories, but she is never the passive damsel in distress. So some other fans speak about Katniss. Katniss kept me hooked, says Sabah Tahir in a New York Times editorial in 2018. Complex, flawed Katniss with her bow and her braid and her tempered fury. Katniss with her fierce familial love and cussed hope. Katniss who, as a teenage girl, is scarred and underestimated and dismissed by her government until they finally figure out how dangerous she is. Donnell Clayton, who's the COO of the nonprofit organization We Need Diverse Books, says Katniss is a bright reminder of what is required to change the world, defiance, irreverence, and stubborn determination. She says, I needed to read girls like her, girls who weren't so nice, girls so angry that their rage could topple anything in their path, girls that could face the dark, girls who could never be contained. Tahir closes her New York Times essay by saying, the message of the Hunger Games and one of its primary strengths is the challenging power hungry governments can be deadly. The story is ugly because life is ugly. Heroes are not always heroic. The good guys do not always win, and when they do, they are haunted. When the violence of the world knocks at her door, Katniss must fight. So she serves as a timely reminder to all who cared to heed it. Teenage girls are powerful and courageous and capable of great rage, and they should never, ever be underestimated. So let's talk about beauty and glamour and commodification in the Hunger Games. Hidden within the narrative is a subtle reworking of the Cinderella tale. Katniss is unlike Cinderella because she is the center of a small family she loves, mothering her little sister Prim as well as her own mother, who is distraught and depressed since the death of her husband. Yet she resembles Cinderella when, to participate in the 74th Annual Hunger Games, a couturier of handlers and stylists, including Hamich, Effie Trinket, and Cinna, transforms Katniss into the bell of the ball. The handlers understand that Katniss's transformation will charm and seduce Pan Am sponsors who are hungry for entertainment, unlike Katniss and some of the other children in the districts who are literally hungry. Capital citizens, though, want the competitors to fit their own superficial, exaggerated idea of beauty, a beauty rendered ugly by the nauseating excesses of capital life. Collins spoke to aspiration and commodification all at once, and the larger way that Katniss is forced to transform in order to survive. She has to become a girlfriend, a proto-wife, and then a prospective mother to garner the sympathy and interest of the crowd. She has to belong to a certain kind of narrative to be seen as valuable as at all. And that's something young women and girls soak up every day from the media and on their Instagram feeds. These are just three images of Katniss Evergreen from the films. 
Um, this is the, on the left hand side, we see Katniss and Effie Trinket. And Katniss is dressed in a very simple short sleeve gray dress that her mother lays out for her and, and you know, cleans and presses so that she'll look um, acceptable for the reaping. In the next two images, we see what has happened to Katniss's image as her coterie of, of stylists and handlers realize that this is entertainment. It's not about survival only in physical terms, it's about entertainment for the capital. But she is commodified to the extent that if she is perceived as entertaining by the citizens of the capital, they will sponsor her in the games. They will provide her with essential things like food and water and medicine. So this is a, this is a completely commodified society. It's a society where Katniss's survival is literally for sale. What I think is interesting is that the true power of archetypal beauty does in fact go deeper over the course of these films. Effie and Sinna's efforts to glamorize Katniss, seemingly superficial, end up creating the elegant and potent symbol of the rebellion, the Mockingjay. Sinna understands beauty in service to truth, and he is murdered for it. Effie learns more slowly, but the arc of her character is one of the most dramatic and moving in the entire narrative. Stripped of her superficial adornments, which you see here on the left, the vulnerable Effie becomes beautiful. In the end, archetypal beauty displays her own form of power. Katniss uses her commodification against the capital and as the Mockingjay defeats Pan Am. In conclusion, the question real or not real is a persistent one for Katniss as she negotiates her identity as a desperate and hungry, hungry girl, as a sacrifice to quiet more than peace, and as a hunter, ally, friend, and lover. She will need all of her predatory instincts to negotiate the tricky terrain of becoming the Mockingjay. The symbol of the rebellion, which is a role she never coveted and would happily relinquish. An equally important question that Katniss slowly and silently answers for herself is who is the ultimate game maker? Liberation for Katniss and the others is not a one-time achievement. It is a daily act of perception. It is as well the actions that arise from clear seeing. So it is with us in this moment of cultural chaos. The Hunger Games ultimately offers us a fantasy ending of liberation, including the restoration of democracy ruled by Commander Paler, a leader who is inspirational, passionate, articulate, female, and black. A battle-scarred veteran of the rebellion, she emerges from and represents the voice of the people. And in her leadership style, there is a promise of collaboration, not tyranny, heterarchy, not hierarchy. The film also offers a fantasy conclusion personal to Katniss and Peta. Their District 12, formerly a heap of twisted and blackened rubble paved with human skeletal remains, is now restored as a healthy green world. It is nearly unrecognizable. The renewed District 12, which may in fact no longer be a district at all as a result of political reorganization, offers a pastoral setting for the young family of four. There is a future beyond the horrors wrought by greed, tyranny, oppression, and ecocide. Real or not real? One wonders or should because alongside this golden pastoral setting are the final words of Plutarch Evansby, the last game maker and architect of the rebellion. We are, he says, fickle, stupid beings with poor memories and a gift for self-destruction. Real or not real? Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth for that wonderful presentation on Katniss and uh, the situation we're in. And, uh, you know, uh, Biden, of course, who's announced that he will be running with, with a woman, uh, today decided he's building his whole campaign around Build It Back Better. 
you know, so, so I, you're ending on this rebuilding a new world. And, and, um, and I think that that's where all of our hearts and hopes are. And, and I hope that you've shown us uh, uh, or shared the blueprint <laughs> from the film for us on that. I, I want to pass it off uh, to a couple of our uh, special guests tonight. And I, so I'll just add one quick point before we do. And that is um, when you're talking about representation, I think this is a really important issue. And I think there's a little bit of nuance I want to add. And that is that, you know, not only is it important for, let's say, a black woman to be able to see another black woman on screen, it's also, you know, I believe important for a white man to be forced to project into a black woman, you know? And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can project into a toaster, you know? And if we can only project into people that look like us, we're in trouble. It should be the other way around. It should be opportunities to put ourselves in more and more and more people's shoes, so. Um, well, I definitely projected myself into General Okoye, so I had no problem with that at all. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, as we bring down our own inner boundaries, we, we can do that more and more. Uh, you know, and, and with that, I thought I'd see if, if uh, John uh, wants to keep this moving in the direction of, uh, of popular culture and reflection. Uh, and I know he's worked with this material as well. Well, first, let me just say, um, Elizabeth, I, I am very excited and uh, inspired by your presentation. Uh, it, it was just excellent. Um, you know, to build off where Will kind of was taking us, um, as a, a white cisgendered male, uh, the, the odds have been forever in my favor, to quote the, uh, the parlance of the book. Um, and I think it is um, encouraging, you know, just on a, a, a 30,000 foot level to see um, stories like this, uh, you know, about women, but I'm, I'm equally encouraged that these are stories with a mythological base in pop culture. Uh, obviously, we have the Artemis archetype in spades when it comes to, um, you know, this character in so many ways that, that she operates. I also thought uh, that it, it might be fitting to mention, um, because you, you did so wisely include uh, ideas about representation in this series, um, that this is an archetype that's not just appearing uh, in, you know, um, uh, these types of films or, or in, you know, YA fiction. Uh, Watchmen, the HBO show, has been discussed quite a bit lately and that this is the story of a black woman, Regina King, who's in a very similar type position. So I think the archetype is coming out there. I also would suggest that the archetype is not limited to this genre. I think sometimes we we only think of it, you know, in terms of the action adventure, you know, type stories. But I, I thought it might be worth mentioning also that uh, there's a there's a show on um, Amazon Prime called High Fidelity that is Zoe Kravitz is the star and she is navigating the 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 battlefield of love in a very similar way that Katniss uh, uh, navigates this this very literal battlefield. But as you described Katniss and all of these archetypal qualities. Um, I kept thinking about Zoe Kravitz's character in this comedic story where she has every one of these qualities. So I think the archetype is, is finding ways through that we, we might not see. Um, the last thing I'll say is that I, I believe um, it's so important uh, to, to recognize uh, the, the divine feminine issues that are at play in this story, especially with the archetypes, because when, you know, Hunger Games first uh, came out, there were some comparisons to an Asian film that had come out a number of years before called Battle Royale. And it is a sadistic masculine vision of the same idea of children being put in a confined space and forced to kill each other with one winner. Um, but if you watch that film and then you take a look at the Hunger Games, it's so clear that the, the Hunger Games is this archetypal course correction of, of the thinking that was occurring uh, during that time. And for me, it really stands out, you know, in the first uh, story with the murder of Rue, um, 
you know, what, what happens in that moment where an African-American is killed, um, the people begin to riot, the police come in, there's a, it, it looks like it's cut right from our evening news, um, you know, in that story. It, and to me, that's, that's just so clear that the, the archetype had fully course corrected and embraced uh, where we're really at rather than sort of a sadistic fantasy about um, our, our appetites for destruction. So thank you again, it was a tremendous presentation. Thanks, John. Yeah, some excellent points. And I, I think one of the one of the places in the story where we really do fall in love with Katniss, if we haven't already, is her care for Rue. She sort of adopts Rue as a as a little sister, and then um, very importantly in that moment in the story, she um, she buries her in in a, in a beautiful ritual fashion. So she's she honors her death. She, it's not just, um, she, she transcends the, the, the commodification that runs throughout the narrative. And I think that's, a, that's an extremely important point. Thanks, John. Corinne, I see you're unmuted. Do you wanna jump in? Yeah, because I wanna dovetail on some of those great thoughts and once again, and also echo what a beautiful, incredible uh, presentation. Um, and I wanna say that one of the things is that I love to do and that I do research is, filmmakers and authors and what role myth plays in their life, because mm. I think that is something that feeds um, these stories. So I want to bring up two or three really interesting things. I'm going to say a quote uh, from Suzanne Collins. She says in an interview, I was a huge Greek mythology geek as a kid, and it's impossible for Greek myth to not come into play in all my storytelling. Mm. That is a beautiful, beautiful quote. Um, and another thing, I'm always fascinated about how stories origin. So she talks, there's so many different uh, webinars and interviews of her talking about the role of Greek myth in, her, in this story, which are fascinating in themselves. But she said this particular story came up because one night she was channel searching and one minute she was watching a reality TV show and then she went over to footage from the Iraq war and like, and then she had her myth in her background and the three of those kind of jumbled is where the idea for the story for the Hunger Games came. Um, so I thought that was totally fascinating. She also mentioned specifically the myths that have really uh, imprinted this particular film were uh, the Greek myth of, um, I'll butcher this, Theseus, and also all the Romian gladiator and images of char uh, chariots came very much into her, um, uh, into this. And the fact that her father served in the Vietnam War, which mm. shaped a lot of her childhood. So that was another, love all these little fun facts that kind of mythically tie together. And one of my favorite things I ran across, I hope uh, Dana can share it with everyone, because it's a stunning PowerPoint of all the mythical elements in the Hunger Games. And after all my research and studies, I thought I knew everything. Well, I, I knew nothing because this went on and on and on. And here, I'll just, I won't bore you with all the details, but everyone, it should be required viewing. But just some of the things they pointed out were the images that are in the um, mythic images in the film, Robin Hood, um, Diana Hunt of the Goddess. I can't I can, help it, but I, I wanted to mention see. Robin Hood. Just yes. He's hunting, she's hunting in land she's not allowed to hunt in and killing a deer she's not allowed to kill in the opening exactly. sequence. Exactly. And where's the same tights as him? Yeah. Yes. Where's the same tights? Dana, I'm going to do a Jeopardy show at the end. And we're going to go, yes. So um, uh, medieval, uh, ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. um, the golden bow was mm -hmm. cited three or four mm -hmm. times. Imagery mm -hmm. from the golden bow. Imperial Rome. Chariots. Um, it goes on, uh, yes, so it goes on and on and on, but it's one slide after another after another. And I said to Dana, my gosh, by the time we're done with all this, it's a whole nother evening of just all the mythical elements of the film. And the last thing I'll wrap up with is that's just her. Gary Ross is his own fascinating character. Think about him. He did big. He did think of all the different movies he did. Uh, what's the one? Pleasant Bell. Mm -hmm. The reality show. So, and if you read his interviews, I actually took a course from him once at UCLA. He's hugely impacted by Greek mythology. So, anyways, I, those are uh, you know just dovetailing off of John. I just thought all of those are kind of like fun factoids. 
those are very fun factoids, Corinne. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are there are so many parallels. To, oh, you to, can go on. I got scared. Oh, you you can go on and on and on. All these, I'm like, we could be here all night. Yeah, we could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and of course, reinforces the beautiful theme that I know is so important to you, Corinne, when you do the the film festival at Esalen. Just constantly showing the relationship between communities like ours and conversations like ours and what's going on in storytellers' minds. You know, so it's awesome to have, you know, you and John who, who are in that world, uh, come speak that voice, you know, just about just how much these storytellers are intentionally, you know, working with this material and how much better their work gets when they do. Right, and I'll just end by saying, you know, as you know, I'm working on a book right now that comes from a different slant, which is interviewing filmmakers of how they use myth, symbol, and imagery in their films. And I am fascinated by the interviews I'm having just fascinated. And sometimes they don't even realize how much they're doing it until you start interviewing them. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, and, and then the last thing, one last thing, I'd say this is a shameless plug for, I have forever in a day been trying to get a excellent, I mean, a Pacifica film festival and conference up and running. We had to uh, postpone it this year because of COVID, but so we could have presentations like Elizabeth's and we could have John and we could have probably half the participants and yourself mm -hmm. and we could show films and have these rich discussions. At, show a film, have a discussion, have a panel. So don't get me started on that. Then um, that's a whole nother thing. But the more I see work like this, the more I know we have to persevere with that well. Note to self. Note, note to self. Send me an email. I'm, I'm happy to join in on this effort. You bet. Oh, we have another. There we go. You yeah. just got signed up for a committee, Elizabeth. <laughs> I, I'm there. Count me in. <laughs> yeah. oh. Well, those are my thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Elizabeth, beautiful presentation. I, I had every expectation it would be thus. I'm inspired by the demonstrative females on both sides, whether they're on screen or whether they're on the creative side. And I, I think this represents a, a really provocative and wholesome shift in our culture. And I wish it would spread into other areas. You know, when I see Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I'm, I'm just in love with her. I mean, I, I mean, she's like a little warrior out there. And she doesn't take herself so seriously that she gets lost, that her politics get lost. But, you know, last year we, was it just last year we had Vanessa Taylor. Women today and men who believe in women like that don't have to buy into the conventional stereotype with no dimension. And, and I think this is really important because we're breeding a new sort of cultural human being. Somebody who can think for themselves, who is an inspiration to other people who think for themselves and who trusts the community that they are empowered to serve. And, mm -hmm. and when you see something like that happening, it to me, the characters on the screen, they become more realistic. You know, I could imagine Katniss, and she is the same thing like Daenerys in Game of Thrones, you know? And so I, I just think that these are terribly interesting characters because they can be fully developed. You know, she is the reluctant hero writ large. So many, many thanks for, uh, you know, bringing this presentation in and, you know, for being a friend and, you know, for all these years, and you know, I can say I, I knew her when. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Yeah. But so. I, I, ag I agree with you about the complexity of these female protagonists. That's one of the, the marvelous things about them is that, yes, we can pinpoint a, a few archetypal patterns. You know, obviously, um, you know, Diana, if we want to use the Roman name, Artemis, if we want to use the Greek name, um, but she's so much more than that. And, and that's what's really fascinating. She's mm -hmm. a very loving and nurturing young woman. So we see some of, um, we don't see Hera, but we see a little bit of Hestia in her, for instance, you know, the goddess of the hearth. Um, 
we, uh, I think we can see Venus or Aphrodite, certainly in terms of the way that her handlers want to um, fashion her, uh, li quite literally fashion her. But then we see the power of archetypal beauty. We see what that does in the narrative. So she's, she is complex and interesting. She's vulnerable and fierce. She's courageous and she's, she makes mistakes. She's, she's all of those things. I wondered if I could pose another question to Elizabeth because, um, you know, Donald Sutherland's character bears a physical resemblance to Donald Trump in many ways, but also um, th there just seems to be some uncanny uh, parallels to the, uh, the the authoritarianism that we you know see um, in that and. I love so much uh, what you've talked about, you know, as far as the Katniss and her archetype. I wonder um, if you might riff a little, I would love to hear you riff a little on um, uh, the, the archetype uh, that, that Sutherland's character portrays um, mm -hmm. in yeah. that authoritarian sense. Great question, John. Thank you for that. So this is Cornelia Snow. And what's interesting is that uh, Suzanne Collins just published the prequel, if you will, to The Hunger Games. The Ballad of Songbird and Snakes, and it shows the development of the character of Snow. So we get his backstory, so to speak. You, you can get an idea. Um, God, I would never insult Donald Sutherland by say he, he's by saying that he resembles <laughs> Trump. But but the other thing that we're we're extremely fortunate in that he uh, that Cornelia Snow um, doesn't resemble Trump in the sense that Snow has a very strategic mind. He is an expert, adroit politician and communicator. He understands how to use the camera. He understands when to speak and when not to speak, right? So he's, he's very unlike, uh, he's very unlike Trump in that respect, um, which makes him more dangerous. Frankly, he's, he's a far more calculating, uh, intelligent, uh, strategic individual. Um, and uh, he's also quite sneaky. We learn in the course of the stories that his favorite weapon is poison. So he, he is stealthy uh, and, and clever. Um, so um, many of his qualities, and, and I, I do really, I believe that he believes his own press. I believe that he thinks that the annual Hunger Games really is a, a good way of keeping peace in the districts. But the only way that he actually keeps peace in the districts is to, is to divide the districts from one another, to keep, to sow discord. So in that respect, he's very similar to Donald Trump in that he is sowing discord among the people. He's helping, you know, this district fight that district, right? And then we find out, I'm sorry, this is a spoiler alert, we, we find out at the end of the series of stories that the ultimate game maker is Alma Coyne, who was pitting President Snow against the district so that she can, she can sweep in um, and scoop up power. And uh, one of the marvelous things at the end of the series is that Katniss, without knowing, without revealing this to anyone, anyone, realizes that Alma Coyne is the true game maker. She's the true threat. She's the next snow, right? And so she agrees to hold another Hunger Games as a, strat as a strategic move in order to be able to kill Alma Coyne, which she does at the end of the story. So I'm just very glad that Donald Trump isn't as smart as Cornelia Snow. Goes to show that, you that would be scary. <laughs> goes to show how important it is that uh, people that have that power never look that smart. <sighs> Makes me very scary. Taria, I saw that you were ready to jump in. Are you still have a thought? Yes, yes, I do. I um, I just want to say, Elizabeth, how much I enjoyed everything about this. I just loved. It. I loved my homework. I watched all four movies. <laughs> And so that was a really fun homework to have. And, uh, and I just love the way that you took it 
fun and brought in so many different reference points. And so I know you've been thinking about this a long time. We've had conversations in the past and I know you bring a lot of depth of consideration and uh, real intelligence to the whole question of fe female power and how this is it's exemplified in this story. So I just want to say how much I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And, and yeah, thank you. And I, I want to share this thought with you. I don't even know if there's a question in it. Maybe you can help me find the question. But um, as you know, I listen to people's dreams on a daily basis. And often I track you know, the themes of dreams that are coming to me from people from you know, all over. And the, uh, a very consistent theme I've been hearing in the last maybe two, three months is people suddenly getting in touch with their feminine rage and, being a, and saying to a character, the other character in the dream, all of a sudden just like, not gonna be nice, not gonna, you know, not gonna put up with this, not gonna make excuses for this person, not gonna be suppressed or oppressed by this, whether it's a ex-husband or a father or a younger sister or a, you know, it's just like all different characters in the, in the field of these people who have oppressed them in certain ways, suddenly they're getting in touch with their rage. And so I've been noticing that and, and kind of triggered one of my own dreams about that. And then you bring this to me to where I feel like, you know, with that theme already in my head, I'm watching these films and very much aware of the simmering rage that is flowing through her veins at all times. And really how it's her being in touch with her own rage that helps others to galvanize and work with her and trust her. There's something about the power of that rage and the way that she's able to um, somehow the rawness of it, she doesn't allow it to explode in any messy way, almost in any scene in the whole four films, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. She really channels it in an amazing way. And so I'm wondering what you think, you know, the fact that this film series would come to my mind right when I'm uh, having this sort of deep experience about feminine rage, what do you think that's calling us to collectively now to get, and I'm thinking of, you know, the rage of the, of the earth, the planet itself right now. She's raging everywhere. And that part of us, which is the earth and which is our female part, whether we're male or female in our particular bodies right now, is raging because of all that. So I just want to hear you muse on that. Yeah, well, actually the last thing you mentioned about the, about the, the earth herself enraged at how she has been abused and used. Um, I, I think that's, that's a big part of that. I, I think that many people who are sensitive right now, uh, intuitives, um, you know, um, particular, uh, like a, particularly an embodied sensitivity, a somatic sensitivity, what they're feeling is, uh, what we might even call it eco rage. We, we might call it, you know, Ga Gaia's, Gaia's rage. I mean, she, she is very, very angry. And of course, if we go back to Hesiod's Theogony, we know what happened the last time Gaia got really pissed off, right? Uh, it's in the, uh, in the origin story where um, Uranus, the sky, was basically um, covering her every night, okay? And they were, so they were mating every night. She would give birth to a child, one of the Titans and Uranus, who didn't want any children to compete with himself, would stuff all of these children immediately back into the mother's body, back into Gaia's body, right? Until she had had enough and she begs one of her children to help her stop this oppressive behavior. The oppression of, of, the, of an original patriarch right at the heart of the Greek tradition 2,800 years ago. It's about when the theogony was, uh, is credited and, and so what happens is that one of her children comes along, she herself makes the sickle uh, out of adamant, the, 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 the most, the strongest metal known. She makes the sickle out of her own body. So she fashions the weapon and she asks one of her children to help her. And that's when Uranus's genitals are cut off and mm -hmm. cast into the sea. So basically, it's not a good idea to piss off Gaia. I mean, that's kind of the sort of the, the, the meta lesson here, 
you know, not a really good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's also been a lot of talk about female rage, and I think it comes out of the Me Too movement, or it began to um, be articulated in the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, there are a number of women authors who talk about how rage is a form of power, especially when it's contained and directed. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a very important point. It's not that the rage explodes, it's that it's kind of like having your own internal power pack mm -hmm. that you use in, in very strategic ways. Mm -hmm. um, a book that I can recommend is um, Brittany Cooper's, um, I think it's called The Eloquence of Rage, I'm trying to remember, but it's very a very powerful book. Mm. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. I hope we'll all be able to sort of feel that force and use it for for the highest good. I think it's it's yeah, just yeah. energy. It's great energy. It's yeah. great energy. And but it is important how we direct it. That's absolutely extremely important. I wanted to point out the the difference between the main ad archetype and the Artemis archetype. Uh, the main ad, of course, is hysterical. Mm -hmm. Artemis. Trans, transmutes the hysteria into something as focused as an arrow shot, you know, and, and I think that there's a, almost maybe a continuum between them, a kind of uh, between that rage, you know. Um, anyway, just wanted to, just thought it might be interesting to think about those two different mythic characters that, that kind of show the two sides of, of the rage and to point out, like you did, that uh, Artemis or Katniss, uh, that Katniss is the, is the most effective of them all by being able to Hyper focus that that rage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. She's very strategic. That final moment where she she murders Alma Coyne, uh, you know, in front of thousands and thousands of people, you can absolutely see her strategic mind working. It's very calculated, very targeted. She knows exactly what she's doing. And of course, that brings in the uh, Athena uh, archetype. Of course, yeah. of course, it does. I saw Zaman's unmuted, if he wants to jump in. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was, um, I started with the idea of this uh, District 12, uh, the number thing. And I uh, was wondering, like, it takes us back to the, at least the so-called the Middle Eastern religions that each one had a number 12 in there as a disciple, as a tribal, as a representative. As, 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 as goddesses, as starting with, with Mitra. Um, and then uh, it, it comes down to um, the idea where the prophet, uh, prophet Muhammad said, die before you die. And uh, Rumi uh, kind of uh, explains that a little bit better by saying that if you die before you die, then you don't die when you die. Yeah, and in this case, I think it's dying in the gender. That yes, there have been ex, uh, sorry, incremental uh, progress in terms of gender equality and that whole thing that we all know is uh, nothing more than just uh, playing the same game. But it will not happen unless you die in the gender as is in that order and come back, uh, I think the Cinderella was mentioned uh, from ashes. Uh, the phoenix, you rise above that and you establish a, a whole new world order, which is the new order of the new District 12. Uh, if you follow that, if you make a sequence out of that. Uh, so I think that there is, a, there is that need for not only just survival under the circumstance, the way things are. Uh, and I think that probably even the term revolution is not enough for the change. So then it has to be kind of like flipped over, I mean, uh, the, the whole world order, uh, so to say. And in that, once you have died in, the, uh, in, in that first uh, state, you can come back with, uh, with an eternity, with a foreverness. And I think that um, I wasn't there when they wrote the, the script, but I'm saying that if they had to name, give her a name, Katniss, there is a cat, nine lives, and nine is the number of um, infinity. 
in, in, in the Middle Eastern mystical thought at least. So there is that, um, that infinity, that uh, sort of uh, bordering on eternity, uh, that the survival is no longer a question because, because um, in that new order, um, the ideal has been achieved without, without playing this uh, game of the incremental change, which I, I don't think is going anywhere in, in most of the world. Uh, and I think in, in the, some of the world, at least in the Western world, whatever is going on is also hidden in that uh, language of, uh, you know, political correctness, where on the one hand, you, at le you, uh, you, you would say, well, I'm happy that we don't hear the discriminatory um, gender insensitive talk, but whether uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if you don't hear it, it doesn't exist. So it must still be there. And so for it to be uh, eliminated altogether, um, I think uh, there is a need for, uh, you know, uh, dying and, and, and uh, coming back to life uh, on a totally different plane of a new District 12. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Zaman. Thank you for your comments. Um, I think what really is needed is a, is a complete transformation, which is a, a, a dying, a death. You know, it's the journey, as we've, we've spoken about a few times, it's the journey all the way through the underworld so that you emerged, you emerge transformed. And you emerge as an agent of transformation too. I know Boris and I have spoken about this many times. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, I wanted to thank you for it. your presentation was truly inspirational. Um, I have to admit, I, I'm just blown away, brilliant, exquisite. I can't say enough great things about it. Um, you know, being a clinician, I have all these Gen Z's and millennials that are so confused um, and they have all of these uh, cultural parental, societal things imbued on them that a lot of the therapy is trying to pull away to find their own authenticity, which may or not be allowed in their family, which is a whole other thing. So the importance of these strong women roles that are, are being written and produced are so incredible. And what I really loved is how you brought it to the present uh, and how you showed those three young women that are actually engaging and Greta Thurman uh, also. I mean, there are, there are these little sparks of archetypal things coming in, or as Dana mentioned, um, uh, AOC. I mean, mm -hmm. they're coming. But women still don't know and how to how to break through, you know, in their real lives. You know, they're they're caught in, in a lot of ways. And or that's because that's my work. I see them caught. Maybe there's a lot of other people who aren't, but I'm seeing those that are caught. Um, so um, can you speak more to the clinical part of allowing the freedom to, of women to be their authentic selves and how difficult that is? Oh, I, I think it's extraordinarily difficult. Um, I think, um, you know, both, both young women and young men, boys and girls are caught in, in cultural gender scripts. I mean, we see it all the time. So, um, but certainly the, the research, at least, you know, 20, 30 years ago, starting 20 or 30 years ago, showed that there's a, there's a very important moment uh, for young women where, uh, right around puberty, where they really begin to question whether or not it is, it's safe to be strong or to be angry or to speak out or to um, be, you know, even something as simple as being physically expressive, you know, taking up a large amount of space, being excited or excitable. So there, there is a, there's a concerted effort, I think, to, to sort of force young women or teach young women to, to start containing themselves. Probably, well, you know this better than me, but I'm, I'm, what the research I've seen is right around age 10, 11, 12, 
and maybe even younger. Um, and it's particularly confusing um, because it also is at a time where they're trying to negotiate sexual identities, which is just, a, you know, really, really tough. Um, I can't think of a single thoughtful adult that that's honestly says, oh, I wish I was a teenager again. <laughs> no way. You know, nobody wants to be a teenager again. We want that energy, of course, but we don't, we don't want to be teenagers again because we remember that it was tough. So I think we still find these, these interlocking meta narratives that are so damaging. And one of them is systemic misogyny, without question. Um, but another one I think that really affects young women, perhaps more than young men, I'm not sure about that, is the, the commodification of life. You know, the way that, um, that we're taught to be, to sort of productize ourselves, to package ourselves, to look the right way, have the right clothing, have the right accessories. And I, I do think, I don't have the data for this, but I do think that that hits young women more seriously than it hits young men. I don't know, you're in a much better position to know that. No, I, I absolutely agree with you uh, completely. Uh, it, hits, it hits men too, but not to the level it hits women. Uh, you know, the need, especially in Los Angeles, or, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, act, it's almost abusive, what we, what people have to look like, or what people have to starve, or my young girls are starving themselves in order to have to look a certain way. Yes. It's shocking. Yes. It is abusive. I don't think it's almost abusive. I think it is abusive. It's, it's a coercive cultural narrative. I mean, when I hear about, um, you know, 15 and 16 year old girls getting plastic surgery. Does it mean somebody had to sign off on it too? Yeah. Well, there's, yeah, I want, there's that. It, 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 it's, it's, it's unbelievable uh, the number of young women under 25 that all their faces completely Botoxed. Shocking. I want you to know that it's shocking. I see it every day. That's, that's so, and, and if you think about the effects of Botox, Botox it, um, it freezes the muscles of the face so that you can't express yourself. Um, and, and so if we're talking about the containment of rage or voice or energy or excitement or passion, I mean, what an incredible metaphor for how we're supposed to be sort of freezing ourselves, right. you know? You might find this interesting. In ancient Greece, they say that when a woman went to get married, she was so dolled up that she might not be able to move. Really? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, she couldn't move after the marriage either, so. <laughs> That's true, too. <laughs> and you wonder about the plagues and how they relate to that configuration, right? Because we're starting to kind of do the Hestia Hermes thing all of a sudden. Hey, stay safe with the kids. I'll go be the one that puts myself at risk. You never leave the house. I'll go, you know, is like, again, we know there were terrible plagues in Greece. And so you wonder if they could have reinforced that kind of cultural uh, misogyny through, you know, it's an era of dealing with plague, you know, having a bad influence on a, a already negative way of thinking. Uh, well, I wanted to just jump in and take another tangent that might be fun for a riff. Is I read a great article about the use of grain imagery and bread in the film, like even to the point where the name of uh, panum is the Latin word for bread. That they call the first thing at the beginning there is called the reaping. There's the whole imagery of him throwing the bread to her. There's the golden grain fields. Somebody wrote, went on this whole riff that I was thought was just so fat. And you know, once again, you watch the movie, I'm like, did I, did I miss all that? Does anybody, did you catch that? Elizabeth, they know you did. You yeah, I did. Right? <laughs> and, and what do you think of it? I think it's kind of fascinating. Well, I, I think it goes back, um, you know, it's, it's a nod to the, to the Roman um, background of the story, which is Panem et Circensis, which is bread and circuses. That's how you, that's how you kept the citizenry of ancient Rome mollified. That's how you kept the peace, so to speak. So, um, you know, so the, you, you, you could do a whole riff just on how the, the series of films is 
the, the, the narration of the theme of bread and circuses. All that, oh. Awesome, and of course, so many mythic characters are personifications of green. Osiris, Adonis, Dave, Dave, Dave. The corn god, right? Yeah, corn exactly. God, that, that was brought up, yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw Boris is unmuted. I wonder if, if he wanted to jump in with us. Yeah, sure, thanks for the invite. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, and I really mean that. Uh, Will always seems to be looking out for me, so I appreciate that. Um, Elizabeth, um, when I'm sure all of you have heard of Rebe uh, Rebecca Solnit, and she talks about mansplaining. Yes. So I'm going to reverse that uh, and use um, Selena's wonderful description, how she felt about your presentation, and let her woman explain for me. So I want to double down on what she said. It was absolutely marvelous. And I'll tell you why I think so, and then I'll ask, I'd like to ask you a question. One, uh, I love the way that you used otherness in your presentation. It wasn't just about difference. It was more in the way, you, you deported in the way that Emmanuel Levinas talks about mm. otherness as being ethical. And your use of otherness is very ethical in the sense, right, mm. that, and this is the second point I want to make about it, is that not only did you not use them merely as difference, but as size of epistemology that they know something. It's a way to be in the world. And you just, it was just marvelous the way you did that, right? So that was great. And secondly, what I really was moved by, and there was so much, I remember John last week was saying, oh, he had so many questions. And I'm like, how could that be? And now I understand what John meant. I just have like, I'm so moved by it. But the second is the way you talked about power, that we can rethink notions of power through a kind of a feminine lens, right? And, and even Michelle Foucault talked about power is not either or, right? We all have certain kinds of power, et cetera, et cetera. So I love the way that you did that and kind of unsettled the way we think about power. It's really, really uh, smartly done. And now my question is, I'd like you to elaborate more on the notion when you talk about Katniss and that she was a person first and then everything else was second. Mm -hmm. and, 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 that sh and that reveals the depth of your analysis because Octavia Butler, talking about the parable of the sower, argues that she assumes her blackness, she assumes her sexuality, her lesbianism, she assumes A, B, C, and D, she's on to something else. And Katniss is on to something else. So could you talk a little bit more about how she privileges her personhood first rather than these other kinds of categories? Yeah, oh, that's a great question, Boris. Thank you so much. And thank you for bringing in Levinas. Um, um, I mean, we'll have to talk about that another time. <laughs> but, um, well, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that I think that makes Katniss so compelling is that um, to a certain extent, her character is shaped simply by the fact of the need to survive. And, and she, she is, she, at no point is she impressed with herself. Mm. At, at all the time that she's groomed to be, you know, the symbol of the rebellion, the darling of the capital, you know, all of the, you know, the fancy dresses and the hairstyle and the makeup and all of that, at no point do you see Katniss herself buying into any of that. In mm. fact, she resists it. So there's a way in which she retains a kind of an integrity of, of, of who she is, where she comes from. She comes from District 12. She adores her younger sister. Um, she protects her mother. She, is, she loves her friend Gail. She loves and maybe is in love with, with Peta. Um, but she, she never leaves her roots, if you will. She, mm. she, she has this identity that's forged in poverty and um, travail, um, that's, that's forged in you know, a very, very bleak surrounding. And I think what you see throughout the, the story is that she, she, she doesn't, she's not, this is it, she's not seduced. She's never once seduced by the capital. She recognizes when she's being used. She knows who's using her, right? And that, that's what ultimately leads to the, to the way that she kills Alma Coyne at the end of the stories. She recognizes who's using her, but she never, um, 
she, she never um, benefits from it. Um, she never plays into it, or she plays into the, it to the extent that she has to play the game, but mm -hmm. it never becomes part of her identity. Oh yeah, that definitely answers. Um, I'd like to ask another question. So how does yeah. female rage play into her part, her character? Because, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, one of the things, I mean, the, the, the probably the most obvious place we see this in the films is when um, they want to shoot what are called propos, propaganda films, so that uh, to you know, portray her as the symbol, as the Mockingjay and the symbol of the rebellion. And you discover later that she's being completely manipulated, right? Wow. So she's being, she's being objectified, she's a commodity, she's a symbol, they're turning her into something else. And they, they try to film propos of her behind a green, or in front of a green screen, you know, in, in, in a studio, and she completely fails. She utterly fails because she's no actress. Mm -hmm. So it's when she's actually shown what has happened to District 12, which is, it has been bombed into oblivion. Um, when she's shown uh, what's happening in District 2, when she's actually on site and she sees the way that the Capitol has created this profound dystopia, then her rage is genuine it's, uh, and it's explosive. But it's explosive and articulate at the same time. That's what's yeah, interesting. That's right. yeah. 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 She's, she's not a mouthpiece at any, at any point. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the answers. Well, I'd like to follow up on the commodification that you are talking about and the way in which technology plays a huge role in terms of the film, because the capital is built on technology and tradition. And they have these policies, these procedures, everything is all carefully laid out. And they've been able to keep all of the 12 districts apart from one another and, and design these rituals like the beheadings or the shootings or what have you. And Katniss moves towards technology in order to use technology to overthrow the capital. And, and she uses it in, in, a, in a really mindful sort of way it she never believes in the technology she was a much better archer at the end of the movie than she was at the beginning she had heart at the beginning but at the end she had strategy and so her tactics supported the strategy of trying to do everything that she could to bring down the capital and the people who were running it and i i just thought that she never, as you say, she never was seduced by it. She never, she never became, you know, one of them. The role of technology in this was really compelling. Yes, it, I mean, it is, it is very interesting. Um, and one of the things that you learn when you read the prequel novel, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, is that the original games were very low tech. Um, but they weren't very interesting. And they had to find a way to sort of, um, if you will, I'll, I'll borrow a technical phrase, um, get eyeballs, right? You had to find, they had to find a way to bring the residents of the capital into and per participate in the games. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that we see in, in the original trilogy, the Hunger Games trilogy, is that the, the, the game itself is a technological marvel. And each game environment is different. Um, so that's the game within the games. I mean, the, the, the children are, are placed into this environment without any clue whatsoever about what that environment will, will face them with. The only clue that they have actually is the kind of clothing that they're given before they enter the game, the game field, if you will. Um, but there's one moment in the second film that, um, that I think is very important. And Laura Lee Scott and I talked about this and it's the moment where um, they're in a, the, the game field, if you will, is like a, a large clock. They finally figured this out. And um, so uh, what, what they realize, they're trying to figure out a way to, to sort of destroy the game. 
And Katniss wraps a piece of the electrical wire around her arrow and shoots it at the dome. And that's what actually brings down the game. And I think that's a fantastic metaphor for the way our, our meta narratives are these overarching stories mm -hmm. or belief systems. We don't even realize we're in the game until we recognize the dome over our heads and we look around at, at, at how we're being played against one another. Amplification on your dome, uh, that the, the Senate, the democracy was established in Rome. Uh, mythically, the myth of how that got done is when Hercules breaks through the dome of a cave to defeat a cyclops. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So where is your dome? Mm -hmm. Where is your dome? Where are your domes? Well, I think that would be the question. Uh, Michelle Coletti, do you want yes. to say something? Sure. A, great presentation, and B, when you were um, listing uh, Katniss's attributes, and you know, you were saying how what Katniss does is that she builds community. I mean, my thought was, well, that's an archetypal feminine kind of attribute, building community. So if you wanted to riff on that. Yes, I, I would be happy to riff on that. In fact, that's one of the distinctive features of these fierce young women that I've been in love with for a long time and been talking about and writing about. Um, they, they are community builders. Um, they, they aren't willing to divide and conquer. It, it's a completely different... And I'm not even sure it's necessarily strategic on their part. Um, it's just simply an outcome of, of the way they feel toward the other and the way they themselves have been othered. So there's a kind of a natural uh, inclination to include. Um, there's a natural inclination to build bridges between communities. Um, there is a refusal on the part of these young women to, uh, um, to, to sort of, you know, re recoil or retract into, um, you know, their own small uh, homogenous tribe. Um, and we see this as a theme in, in a lot of literature and a lot of young, uh, young adult fiction. Now, I want to help add distinguish that from the masculine inversion, which is the general who rallies multiple armies. You know, the general does know that they've got to get all these different disparate armies to get on their side or the Avengers to all join. But that's different than it being emergent from a communal priority. Right. Yeah, I mean, I truly think one of the most hopeful aspects of the film series is that the person who becomes the new president of Pan Am, and I'm not even sure we can call it Pan Am because it's, it's been completely reorganized, is Commander Paler from District 8. She's this beautiful black woman who, you know, has, um, you know, obviously been a warrior and a leader. She's been the commander of, of, of District 8. And um, she gives this rousing speech, I think it's in the third or fourth film, um, where she says, you know, to the assembled, all of the people from the assembled districts, we've already won. We're standing here together. You know, I mean, that's, that's just a fabulously inspiring speech. You know, so she's, and she's the voice of the people. I mean, she comes up through the ranks. She's not, um, there's just this sense, both in, in how she's costumed and how she speaks, that she's, she's really of the people, not over the people. Definitely. Uh, and I guess yeah. I'm wondering if you wanted to take that one step further and comment on the times we are living in right at this moment. Well, okay. So yeah, I mean, the, uh, the three young women that I, that I uh, showed pictures of, um, the 19-year-old, mm -hmm. I don't remember all of the names, 19, 17, 15, all of them sort of, you know, leading, creating, you know, protest marches um, coming forward. Um, you know, it's just a wonderful example of, I'm going to reach everybody I can who cares about this like I do, and I don't care what color or gender you are, I don't care what your age is, we're just, if, you know, that we're going to organize a community of people who share the same, the same concerns, the same passion. Um, Another example would be the, uh, the uh, Trump's uh, presentation, his political uh, rally in, help me here, Tulsa. Was it Tulsa, Oklahoma? 
-hmm. I believe, yeah, that was um, apparently interrupted <laughs> by a group of uh, adolescents, as I understand it, who, you know, used social media, you know, yeah. they deployed technology to uh, basically buy a bunch of tickets to the Trump rally right. and... Mm, yeah, not show. Exactly. And not show. So there's this youth, youthful energy that I really love. Yes, uh, I totally love it too. And I'm, I'm wanting it to percolate really up the echelon <laughs> to get into the power structures. I, yeah. I'm hoping it doesn't take us 20 more years to have what's happening now, you know, uh, get up to the echelon. Any other thoughts? Um, I'm hoping so too, and I think one of the, I think these films and, and the, the archetypal perspective that I was introducing with Richard Frankel's work is one of the ways that this can happen, which is, um, yes, these are adolescent leaders and they're, they're brilliant and Im impressive, but guess what? We have an internal adolescent. We have that archetypal pattern mm. that basically says enough. We can reactivate the fierce young woman in ourselves, no matter how old we are, we can reactivate fierce young men in ourselves. We can find that adolescent um, urge um, to change the world. And I think what's very important is we can combine it with the kind of cool, tactical and strategic thinking we see Katniss demonstrate at the end of the film. Mm -hmm. In other words, we need to, we need to use the rage and direct the rage. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Good to hear from you, Michelle. You too. Oh, and turn this into a book. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this, this is good. This, this needs to be a book, seriously. Especially okay. discussions of power. I think people need to hear that. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's go to um, Wendelin. Hi, Elizabeth. Loved Hi, it. Wendelin. I hope everyone's doing well. I just also want to say is the thing for me with Katniss is she never loses her internal ethics and moral compass. And she's the one person who is altruistic and that's what makes the other groups love her and listen to her because she stays, you know, true. And I think that even with all the hardships, even with all the things that come up against her, you know, there are places where you think, oh, is she going to turn? And she doesn't. And that makes you feel very, um, you know, it's, it's good. It makes you feel good. She's not selling out when, you know, so many people do sell out. Absolutely. I totally agree with Gwendolyn. It's, it's um, kind of what I was trying to say when I said that she doesn't become a commodity. She doesn't allow her, she doesn't get sold. Yeah. I mean, she is sold by the capital and by the rebellion as a, as a symbol and a, as, a, as a Hunger Games participant. She herself never buys into the commodification of, of Katniss. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then the other thing is, is when she, you know, kills, you know, both the Donald Sutherland character and the, the other leader, because that leader has shown herself to be just as bad as Donald oh, yeah. Sutherland. She is, <laughs> she is the ethical assassin, you know? She is the ethical assassin. And I know you've written about that, which is, which is a very good way of thinking about her. She is the ethical assassin at that moment, without question. Thank you again. And um, just, I love this series, and please keep more coming. And sorry, I have to run now. <laughs> Thanks, Wendelin. <laughs> Good well, to see I you, Wendelin. To something that Wendelin said and build on it, uh, what you're saying about uh, a commodification, which relates to consumerism and ultimately materialism. Mm -hmm. and, and I wanted to ask, you know, because one of the obvious biggest themes in Hunger Games is scarcity. And, and just while I'm on it, I want to plug that the next myth salon will be very much around the theme of materialism. So, so as we, you know, move into that, but I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about the theme of scarcity, because obviously that's one of the big themes that we have going on in our world right now. And we're anticipating, what, 250 million people are going to die of hunger right now because of COVID. Uh, so, so anyway, I wonder if the theme of scarcity and, and actual hunger is something you wanted to speak to in our, some of our last moments. Well, sure, yeah. I mean, I, th I think there's no, it's no accident that the, the, the franchise is called The Hunger Games. And, um, you know, one of the most obvious ways that this fiction, if you will, represents reality is the obscene 
concentration of wealth in the capital and the extreme poverty in the districts. So this is where I was referring to it as dystopian fiction, where the only, the only way that you can create a utopia, if you want to call the capital a utopia, certainly there's plenty in, in the capital. Um, the only way you can create a utopia is by also creating a dystopia. So there are the haves and the have-nots, and, and the division between the two of them is extreme. Um, there's an interesting moment in the last film where Gail is traveling in towards the capital uh, to uh, basically to, to take down the capital from the inside, and you see him eating some of the capital food, and and he 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 tastes it with a sense of disgust. It's like, ugh, you know, I, I don't, this is not, this is not what I want to eat. This is not my kind of food, which again goes back to the theme of bread and bread and circuses. But there's something about the capital and its extreme refinement um, and its extreme um, abundance, but, but it's, it's a kind of a monstrous abundance that set alongside the monstrous poverty in the districts, the scarcity in the districts, um, is one of the ways this is such a successful example of dystopian fiction. Let's make Hunger Games fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's make Hunger Games fiction. And guess what? It ain't. Well, I would like to really commend you, Elizabeth, for a, a wonderful afternoon and an evening for Terria because it's nighttime back there. I, I thank, and John, thank you. You know, thank you for coming on here. We'll get you back. All right. Um, and as Will said, next time, in a couple of weeks, we have materiality. And this is a fascinating, fascinating woman who has made a career out of tracking the, the traditions and movement of material goods uh, in, in cultures that are largely defined by their material path. These are the footprints that are down and we study them. I'd also like to real give, give a real shout out to Connie Zweig. She has lined up people, introduced us to people. You just wouldn't believe who they are. I, I just, I'll put it out in the email and let you, let you all read it. So I'm going to do a moment of silence again to close the myth salon down. I would really like to thank my good friend and colleague, Dr. Will Lynn. You know, everything I would hope a partner would be. All right, let's see here. We come from silence, we return to silence. And until next time, thank you all very much for attending the Myth Salon and for being part of it. Thank you, Dana. Thanks, Will. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank everybody. you all. Be safe, everyone. Thank you all. Yes, be safe. Be safe. Uh, <laughs>